Good morning, Saints. How are you? Hope everything is going well. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, we're always bound to give thanks to you, beloved of God, because we know that God chose you through belief in the truth and sanctification of the Spirit. So, uh, Greg's doing a video here on Joe Rogan inviting a, you know, quote unquote, believer of Jesus Christ onto his podcast. And the problem is that the guy gives a false testimony of, uh, he gives a false testimony of faith. And what's interesting about it is Greg's then going to do that himself. He's going to tell you that, you know, if you believe in another Jesus, guys, be very careful when you hear someone say that term that they believe in another Jesus, okay? Because we can derive that from Scripture, that very term, and we could see the context. Okay, so in the area that's grayed out here, we see the verse, and I use the NASB because a little bit easier to understand. Um, so I'll read from the beginning. This is uh, 2 Corinthians 11. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his trickery, your minds will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And then it says, For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit. Here, let me just uh, get that in blue again. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Uh, for if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a, gospel, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, this you tolerate very well. He's saying this to people that are already in the church that are saved. Everything in the Bible that's written uh, about salvation and who God's people are, are to God's people. They're not to the mocker and the scoffer and the unbeliever. So the only thing the mocker and the scoffer and the unbeliever will get is judgment. You will not get what you deserve. You will not get judgment. So um, when Greg uses this another Jesus term, we see it right there, 2 Corinthians 11, 4, another Jesus. Um, it's in a context. These are already saved believers. Remember that first John verse that says, test the spirits to see if they are of God? Well, this doesn't mean they received a different spirit as in they don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. It means that they receive a person that comes to them, wants to take advantage of them. Uh, I think a little bit further down here, there's going to give more context. It says, and I had this verse in my last video about agents of or uh, ministers of righteousness disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds their, or their works. Okay. Um, and so, and then if you look down here at verse 20, it gives a little more context to what these people might look to do. For you tolerate it if anyone enslaves you, if anyone devours you, if anyone takes advantage of you, if anyone exalts himself, if anyone hits you in the face. That's, you know, that would be extreme. To my shame, I must say that we have been weak by comparison. <laughs> so he's, he's telling them, you know, by comparison, he calls himself weak, Paul. Uh, he calls himself a fool. I am speaking in foolishness. You see, he says that. Um, and so he's trying to say, by comparison, you're, you're, you're acting weaker than me. You're allowing these people to come into the church and, and, and say such things. And they should be kicked out of there. Bottom line, that's like someone coming into the Discord server, let's say. And they, they come with their heresy or they're on your YouTube channel, whatever it might be. You kick them out of there. See, if you go to a regular modern church, they just might be like, we got to love everybody, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a big church goer, as many of people who know me know, but I do know that, you know, they, 
when you when you come against something that's not the doctrine of Christ and you dispute it harshly and you rebuke it sternly, I, I've had reactions from Christians before where they're just they're taken aback by it. It's almost like you're speaking a different language to them. And I'm talking about people that just regularly go to church and they're not really, you know, they're not too into the Bible, but they're more into the church scene. And so um, I find that it's very easy to fellowship with like-minded believers is all. Um, if you guys want to leave a comment about that, if you think I'm wrong, perfectly open to discussing it with you as uh, any anything else you'd like to discuss. Once again, try to keep it, you know, cordial and you know, we, we, we can become accusatory very quickly, both sides of the aisle. I, I agree to that. Um, but we really do want discussion. It's just so hard to find it, honestly. Um, but continuing on here. So we see that that's the other Jesus is a different spirit, a different gospel. And so we're going to watch how Greg's going to lump that in with uh, the fact that Christ died for his sheep only. You know, they asked and they said oh yeah i'm really happy with what i believe and yet they believe in another jesus mormons for example you know they believe in a a jesus who is the uh spirit brother of lucifer okay a man of flesh and bones who became a god and so this is a different jesus and you have to believe in the jesus of the bible to be saved mark that mark that you have to believe in the jesus of the bible to be saved okay that's a saying that people like to say. It's not untrue. Problem is, is it's totally subjective to people. It you, you're switching in and out what that really means for for whatever your presuppositional stance is, and that doesn't make it Jesus of the Bible. You have to believe in the Jesus of the Bible, and you have to trust in what He accomplished on Calvary's cross to be saved. So it is important. Which Jesus you believe in? Because there's a lot of false Christs out there, a lot of false saviors, a lot of false messiahs. Um, you know, uh, as I said in my community post earlier, you know, if, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of religions who believe that Jesus didn't pay for all the sins of the world, that he only paid for the sins of a select few who would believe in him, uh, and that salvation. That's actually true. I mean, if you think about it, even Greg Jackson believes in a limited atonement because the atonement is limited to those who will believe. Okay, only in his theology, you must make a moral, ethical decision to become born of God, which is, if, if, if there's another Jesus out there, it's that Jesus. I'll actually put in my description a link to Chris's video on John 3 8 a verse that I think goes widely looked over by many many people including myself uh, just for not having done the proper exegesis and looking at the totality of Scripture to really analyze John 3 8 there's tons of other scriptures that we haven't done that with right so but I'll put the link in the description for that that is not something that you do on your own you did not there's no verse in the Bible that says I believe to become born again of God if you notice in John 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus first that you must be born again. He's just stating a fact. To see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Well, who gives us sight? You know, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving until God grants them repentance and to the acknowledging of the truth. Okay, seeing that they do not see, hearing that they do not hear, lest they turn and be forgiven. Mark 4, 11 and Mark 4, 12 show us that seeing and, and hearing, obviously we have to hear the gospel. Well, he who is of God hears God's words, right? John 8, 47. And we know that God gives us sight because it's he says in Mark 4, or I, I should say Matthew 13 is the same parable. I'll post it up. And he says, to you it has been given the secrets of the kingdom of god have been given but to other others it has not been given so the secrets of the kingdom of god are seeing hearing understanding okay and so it's jesus is very clearly saying to some it has not been given but to you it has been given 
He says to others it has not been given. So, um, and we also see in Romans 8, 32, here's Jesus' sacrifice right here, guys, in Romans 8, 32, okay? Romans 8, 32 says, he that spared not his own son, so God didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. What's the all here in biblical context, guys? Very simple here. This is very easy stuff. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What's the next verse? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That word elect means choice or chosen in this context. The correct verbiage would be who can lay anything to the charge of God's chosen? It is God that justifies. Okay? Look at verse 39. Nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can you say that to a stranger walking down the street? Can you just say to him that God loves you so much that nothing can separate him from his love? Or nothing can separate you from his love? No. Look, it says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. If God loved everyone that way, then there's no need to preach the gospel to anyone. Because nothing would be able to separate them from God's love. So you could see that the, all the context here in Romans 8.32 down to 8.39 is to the saints. What shall we say then? Uh, sorry, what shall we say then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who's the us here? See, God spared his own son for us all. Whoops. For us all. I'm trying to get the blue thing over there. He delivered him up for us all. People might say, see, he died for everyone. He died for all men ever. No. He delivered him up for us all. God delivered up his son, gave him over to wicked hands, and he was killed on a Roman cross for us, for the saints. He redeemed the saints. He didn't redeem all of mankind. If all of mankind had redemption through Christ's blood, they would all turn and believe at some point in their life. They would every single person would be raised up at the last day to life. See, you believe because you are redeemed. And so the person in Joe Rogan's video didn't give the correct testimony of God. So it's very likely he's not a redeemed man or he doesn't know the true gospel yet. He's not saved yet. See, people make that mistake between salvation and redemption. Guys, you have redemption through his blood. When did Jesus shed his blood? Over 2,000 years ago before you ever believed anything. Okay? Uh, so let's continue on. I think I made that point clear. Oh, plus you have John 10. We can always see John 10 as a strong exhortation against this belief that Jesus just died for the mass of humanity. And then you have to go ahead and enter into that uh, atonement. So effectively, Jesus' blood is really going to atone for about, you know, let's say 3% of all of mankind or whatever number, number you want to make a few, because Jesus said a few will find the road to life. Broad is the way to destruction. So uh, we know that it's not a mystery why there's many people on the road to destruction. It's because they're non-elect persons. And I know that makes a lot of people recoil and disgust and God becomes arbitrary, capricious, and whimsical. Um, and they start emoting all over you with comments about emotion and things that are just not even anywhere in the Bible. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He doesn't say anything about the goats here. The goats that he just strongly rebuked and said, you are of your father, the devil. Jesus did not die for the people that he said are of their father, the devil. And he'll say it again here in John 10, 15, as the father knoweth me, even so I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep, period, period. Very adroitly, clearly pointing out who he died for, in his own words. Salvation isn't available to everyone. There's some who believe that you're saved. Right, see, so it's not available to everyone. That's correct. It's not available to everyone. It's available to those that Christ has died for. 
If you believe the gospel, then you're born of God. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, which is part and parcel to the gospel, that he came by water and blood, not by water only, but by blood as well. So you, you have to understand that everyone who's been given to the Father will come to the Son. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. Every single last one of God's people will be saved and they will see the Lord. That is without a doubt. You know why? Because God is sovereign over his own plan of salvation and he shall bring redemption. As Isaiah the prophet said here in Isaiah 43, 7, starting in verse 7, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Guys, how much does that line up with Mark 4.11 and 4.12? Okay, you could see when you rightly divide the scriptures, you can't escape the truth. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. That's implying that they had no sight and no hearing until God gave it to them. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled who among them can declare this and shew us former things. Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen, and that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Guys, we see hearing, we see seeing, we see understanding. First John 5.20 says, He hath given us an understanding so that we may know him who is true, Jesus Christ the righteous. I mean, it's just, it's overwhelming amount of evidence that you believe the gospel because God did that work in you from the beginning. Uh, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Take a look at that. Ephesians 1.4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. What they do with this verse is they say that God didn't choose you until you were in Christ. First Corinthians 1.30 says that it was due to the Father. It was due to him that you are in Christ Jesus. It was due to his drawing. His choosing of you before the foundation of the world. That's why you're in Christ to begin with. So what they want to do is they want to say, yeah, you're not chosen until you believe in Jesus Christ. Go to Romans 8.30. First, the predestination happens, then the calling, then the justification. That's the order in which things occur. And no action of man is being written about there in Romans 8.30. And remember, we were just in there, Romans 8.30. Oh, I switched over to John 10, but that was also leading into all those verses about the one who delivered him up uh, for us, will he not also give us free, uh, freely all things? Well, a non-believer is not going to be given redemption. Uh, well, I should say, I should say, I should word it like this. A non-believer doesn't have redemption. They're not given sanctification. They're not given wisdom. They're not given righteousness. They're not given any of those things until they're in Christ, right? And the only reason why you're in Christ is due to him. It is due to him that you're in Christ Jesus. So when this verse reads, according as he hath chosen us in him, what it doesn't say is he chose us in him after we used our free will to believe in Christ. Then we were in Christ. Then he chose us. You see how much adding in I have to do to make that work? No. The one who does the choosing is God as he hath chosen us in him. Doesn't say anything about our choice there. So you don't get to mishandle the scripture and say, well, it says in him, so we weren't in him till we believed on him. We already know through a multitude of other scriptures why we believe. It's because we've been given an understanding. We've been given spiritual sight. We've been given spiritual hearing. We've been made alive in Christ. And it's all to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted into the beloved. How does him making us accepted have anything to do with your free will choices? 
You don't see any of that stuff in the verbiage here. You just don't. It's all according to the good pleasure of his will. Those who were born of him, they received him because they were born of him. Okay, they didn't receive him because they decided to believe and then they made themselves born again. You're putting the cart before the horse. There is no scripture in all of the Bible that says that you believe to become born of God. The fact that you believe is because you are born of God. And I don't want to keep going too much on that. I'm going to get back into the video here. For your past sins, but then you need to follow the law or repent of your sins. Okay, so that we agree on, right? That's a false Jesus that he only died for your past sins. But this is going to get crazier. To be forgiven of your future sins. Ah, uh, so... Again, that is, a, that is a different Jesus than the one in the Bible. He paid for all the sins of the world, past, present, and future, and they were all future 2000. See, when he says that term, that's 1 John 2, 2. We've already done a video on this. Um, I think, I know I've mentioned it in my videos. I don't know if I did a specific video on 1 John 2, 2, but I've mentioned it. Um, and I'll mention it again. The verse reads that he didn't die for our sins, the Jews, but for the sins of the whole world. Why is that important? Because it's being written in an epistle that was written between 90 and 110 AD. What does that mean? Christ had already been crucified, right? So salvation was of the Jews until Christ went to the cross and did his work. Once he went to the cross and did his work, then he could bring the other sheep in. Like he says in John 10, 16, right here. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. When does he do that? When he goes to the cross. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Okay? So what's the, what's the relevance of this with 1 John 2, 2? Died for the sins of the whole world. Because the whole world isn't every single human being in the world. It means that if Jesus be lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. Well, we know that he had to go to the cross to do that, right? So he wasn't drawing all men of different kinds to himself until he was lifted up on the cross. And that's what 1 John 2, 2 is representing there. That he hasn't just died for the sins of the Jews, that he has died for the sins of the whole world, all tribes, tongues, and nations now. And so that verse is grossly misused to say that the atonement's unlimited, and it's to anybody who will take that opportunity and roll the dice chance. You know, everybody has a chance to believe, right? That's what they say, right? Everyone, that's what the implication is. I mean, that's the strong implication that you get from this is that anyone has the, he said earlier in the video, he says, everyone has the opportunity. So salvation is like an equal opportunity lender. That's like a bank term. It's an equal opportunity to believe the gospel. Uh, well, that's not true because so many people aren't going to believe because they don't understand the gospel. Why is that? Because they haven't been given an understanding. And I think we're going to get to that here. Years ago. Uh, again, you have to believe in the Jesus of the Bible to be saved. Um, and so, you know, this, this gentleman, unfortunately, I don't know his entire background, but who knows? Uh, what he heard about Jesus and what type of Jesus he believes in. He believes, uh, based on his own interview with Joe Rogan, that, uh, you know, Jesus, Jesus is, you know, just came to this earth. Joe said, well, why did he come to this earth? Why did the Son of God come to this earth? Such a thoughtful question. And I was so upset that uh, I wasn't, you know, able to just give a good, solid representation. Right. Greg was so upset that he wasn't there to give them the right gospel, that Jesus Christ died for every single man ever, and that everybody has the free will opportunity to believe. And don't forget, Greg, if you were on Joe Rogan's podcast, that you have to add in, you must believe that it's God's, God gave you free will to choose. Otherwise, it's a different Jesus. Don't forget to add that in there, because he made himself clear on that position, that if you believe God chose you unto salvation, you have another Jesus. If you believe that Jesus Christ only died for his sheep, you have another Jesus. Don't forget to, you know, get that in there when you get on Joe Rogan's podcast, if that's ever to happen, so you can give them your gospel. Of what the Bible says, you know. And it was such a letdown because so many people, you know, thousands of people that watch this video now think 
that Jesus came uh, to teach people how to be good and to live good lives. So now they think, oh, okay, well, if I can just live a good life and follow the example of Jesus, he said Jesus came to set an example of how we should live our lives. Uh, well, I guess that's, you know, he certainly did set a good example, the perfect example, right? But uh, the reason that Jesus came to this earth is to save sinners from the penalty and punishment of their sins. He came... Uh, he came to save his people from their sins, Matthew one twenty one. Okay? And so there's no doubt about it. But what's interesting is that you could see that Greg is disappointed because man is screwing up God's salvific plan. Um, guys, there must be heresies among you that they which are approved may be manifest among you. And so I think it's important to understand that God works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Nothing is going on in the world right now that shouldn't be happening. Every person that God wants saved will be saved. Okay? No one's going to miss the train to glory. This, this free will chance system is so atheistic in its mindset. It's incredible that he doesn't pick up on that. Absolutely mind-blowing. That he thinks that all these people are going to be lost because God can't get it done. He's relying on human hands. He's relying on man's ability to get up and leave his doorstep and preach the gospel and get more people saved than God ever intended. That is heresy. That to, to take our sins, for he who knew no sin became sin, that we would become the righteousness of God in him, 1 Corinthians chapter yeah, that's Second Corinthians, and let's take a look at that actually, because that's really interesting that he brought that up. I really did want to uh, take a look at that because that's got a personal. Oh, sorry, that's five. What am I apologizing for? <laughs> All right. Um, so let's take a look at these verses in context. Here's the verse that he's saying: "For he hath made him to be sin for us." who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Guys, that is directed at the saints. Look at the context. Therefore, let's start in verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, okay? How are we in Christ? We're in Christ because of him, because of God. But it is due to him, by his own doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Whose own doing? Who has become unto us wisdom, redemption, sanctification, righteousness, so that he who boasts may he boast in the Lord. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So see, now Greg's going to say, well, you're in Christ because you made the free will choice to believe in him. That's not what Paul wrote in the first book of Corinthians. Let's check it out. I'll go to another... Uh, Okay, right here. Uh, whoops, I am in the wrong chapter. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 1, 30, I was in 11. But it is due to him that you are in Christ Jesus. Okay, keep that one there in mind. Okay, but it is due to him that you are in Christ Jesus. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us. Who has he reconciled? By the body of his death, he reconciled us. With Romans 5.10, he reconciled us by his death, so we shall be saved by his life. The fact that Jesus rose again is the reason why you have life through his name. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself, not everyone. And watch, this is going to be mind blown as it continues to read on. Uh, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Did he reconcile every single person? See how they misuse that word world? It's so such a gross mishandling of that word reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto him, 
remember that David said, Blessed is the man that God does not impute sin and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. So there you have it. That's the verse in question. And it has everything to do with people that have been reconciled. And you see that Paul says, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. He's telling them now you be reconciled to God. As in, understand that reconciliation means you have a good standing with God. You have to understand that too. You, God is, is good with you. God loves you, right? You're a saint in Christ. You are holy and blameless. You're loved as the Son is loved. All that stuff. You're seated in the heavenlies. All that great new stuff. But you have to reconcile that for yourself. You have to believe it for yourself. Uh, and so let's see if the, we can continue on here. Uh, First Corinthians 5.21, I believe. Uh, and that really is kind of the core of the gospel, isn't it? He who knew no sin became sin. It would become the righteousness of God in him. Right. He became sin for us, for the saints. He didn't become sin for every single person. This is so, you can just look to the scriptures, look up these words, reconciliation, redemption. You could see those things preceded you believing the actual gospel. So he took our sin, paid the, took our uh, penalty that uh, we owed or took, took the punishment that, that, that we deserved, paid the penalty that we owed uh, on our behalf because he loves us that much. Right. See, so he's, he's saying that he just loves everybody in the world that much. He loves the mocker and the scoffer. He loves the Satanist. He loves the person that will never believe. No, no. That's, he's, he's telling you that basically, listen, believe the gospel because it's a get out of hell free card. It has nothing to do with being one with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with the eternal sonship that we have, all the gifts that we can't even possibly fathom. Okay? That's what salvation is to me. It's not just this get out of hell free card. Obviously, that's a great benefit from it, but yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, he didn't come to teach us how to uh, be good people so that we could possibly become good enough in our own flesh uh, to go to heaven. And yet, unfortunately, that's what, if you listen to this interview, that's the impression that you're left with. And it made me think, all right, this guy couldn't explain, you know, why he believes that Jesus existed. That's just very basic. Um, which leads me to believe that he had a very shallow understanding of the Bible. Um, and that, you know, most people, unfortunately, I believe are like this guy. They right. Let's, okay, let's listen a little bit. They don't more. know who Jesus is, and they don't know what he accomplished on Calvary. Right. So why do you think that is, Greg? See, these people act like it's a complete mystery as to why these things might be. I mean, and this is the deceitfulness of free will philosophy and how it drags you to the depths of this utter ignorance and i don't know if it's willful or what or just a very hard fast and presuppositional stance that doesn't allow you to come out of the blindness guys matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27 we're going to rightly divide it with uh we're going to rightly divide that with john 14 okay i want you to take a look at something here let's go to john 14 17 first uh okay let's let's read from john 14 16 and i will pray the father remember that i will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter and that he may abide with you forever if this isn't salvation i'm not a christian okay even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive more inability it has nothing to do with people people try to tell me well, they cannot receive it because they don't believe. And there's antecedent causes as to why they don't believe. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him not. Okay? 
uh, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, meaning Christ was with them at that time, and shall be in you, because he goes to the Father. So now you have the indwelling. Let's go to Matthew 11. Same Jesus is speaking here. It's not a different Jesus. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. That is God's decision-making capabilities right there. Look at the verbiage. Do not play games with the Scripture. Be honest with yourself. What do you think that means? And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. See, the Father and the Son, they do the same works. You can see that Jesus said, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto myself. But he also says, no man can come to me unless my Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So they do the same works. You can clearly see that. It's not like Jesus is confused or something about who's the one doing the drawing. They do the same works. And so we go back to John 14, 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Neither knoweth him, right? Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. It has to do with knowing, guys. This is also related to God's foreknowledge, okay? Will God cast away his people? God forbid. He will not cast away those he foreknew. That's Romans 11, 2, I believe. Um, he foreknew the people that were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. After the foreknowing, he then predestinated them. After he predestinated them, he then called them. After he called them, he then justified them. And after he justified them, he then glorified them. And that verse says he glorified them past tense. Let's take a look at that. Um, Romans 8. See, Romans 8 is just an absolute field of scorched earth for Greg Jackson's heresy. And he's just overlooking it and just playing pretend. But Romans 8 is just really taking free will heresy by the throat and choking the life out of it. Um, so for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, see, you got to start from this point here, because he's going to show you now how you get to the point where you're conformed to the image of the Son. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Notice how that is in the past tense. Well, are we glorified yet? No. Are we seated in the heavenlies? Yes. I know, it's hard to grasp that, but that's, that's the beauty of the scripture is that there are things in it that you can't fathom in the carnal mind, that you can't fathom in the flesh. And so, yeah, we see that the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive because it doesn't know him. Well, you have to be revealed to the Father by the Son because no man knows the Father save the Son and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So, no man knows the Father save the Son and so there's going to be other people that know the Father, us. <laughs> so, the saints, right? And Christ always knew us. He knew us before the foundation of the world with a salvific love, a perfect love. Oh, going on 40 minutes here. So uh, let me just see if there's anything else in here. They don't know the gospel. They don't know the good news. Right, because God hasn't granted them repentance to come into the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 2.25 and 2.26. See, we know that that is completely written in the Bible. At the question that he doesn't understand is due to his his ignorance and his willful um, stubbornness against the and this is the will of man is is to resist what the Holy Ghost speaks right 
you always resist the Holy Ghost. This is their, they, they try to say this crushes limited atonement. Uh, that it's by our free will that we resist. Acts 751 is not talking about someone who received the Spirit of God and was made born again by the Spirit of God. That's not what Acts 751 is talking about. It's worth addressing, but that would be another hour long video. Um, but that's what they use. They think it's some sort of defeater when Stephen's not giving the gospel to those people. He's just showing them that their will is to resist the Holy Ghost, it, what, what it's saying to them. And in actuality, don't we all do that until we do ultimately come to the knowledge of the truth when, when the Holy Spirit has finally given us the knowledge? I mean, think about it. Even as a believer, you resist the truth that you're eternally saved in the beginning. You struggle with the thought that you might not have to do any work. Wasn't that a struggle for you? I mean, I, I, I know that's anecdotal. I understand that. But a lot of people I speak to definitely struggled with condemnation and fear of not being saved. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Everyone goes to that stage where they don't fully understand that positionally they can't lose salvation. In, in no way can they lose salvation. Forget about positionally. But they, they don't understand that positionally they're seated in the heavenlies. Let me say that. They don't understand that concept that they're already gods, that they can't be lost. They're sons, they're daughters. Um, and the reason why you have to learn that is because you have to grow in grace. It's not an instant download. When you, when, when, when you are revealed that Jesus is the Christ by God and he puts his spirit in you and he makes you spiritually alive, that journey begins at that point. You believe Jesus is the Christ, that's the first step. Anyone who believes that Jesus the Christ is born of God, 1 John 5, 1. But there's a lot to learn after that. You could spend the rest of your days learning about the riches of his grace, right? Because, unfortunately, most religions teach another Jesus. And they... Yeah, so he thinks a lot of people aren't going to get saved because of the false teaching out there. There must be heresies among you, so that the ones who are approved may be manifest among you as well. Uh, so I hope that blesses someone out there in the world somewhere. Um, this is just, you see what this stuff leads to, that, that God's just, he's not going to execute his plan of salvation. Let me just read one more verse for you. It's in Isaiah 55, 11, And it talks about how God's word will do everything he set it out to accomplish. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So he sent his word to us. We're the thing that he sent it to, and we shall prosper in Christ. Okay. So guys, God's word does not return void. If you think that the gospel is being wasted on many ears because they're not making their free will decision to believe, you are going straight against the word of God. You always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. Guys, don't resist. Harden not your hearts and hearken unto him if you hear his word today. That verse in Hebrews 3 is not talking about people coming into salvation. It's talking about Moses and how it was, guys, is Moses saved? I mean, crying out loud. That The picture in Hebrews 3 is about how Moses showed disbelief when he hit the rock twice and he never entered the promised land. Research this for yourself. Final note is that as a believer, you can show a lack of belief in what God has done for you. Even as a believer, like I said, Many Christians are going to go their whole lives and pass away not knowing the riches of God's grace. And we won't truly know them until we're with him. But, I mean, people have lived in condemnation as saved people. They believe the gospel, but they didn't grow in grace and in knowledge of Christ. Maybe they passed away soon after they were saved, soon after they believed the gospel. Um, it's possible that that happened, right? And so you got to you got to think that that person wasn't able to fully understand what they've been freely given by God's grace, right? Okay, now I'm over. I'm out. Talk to you guys soon. God bless.